Welcome back to the Maritime History Podcast. I'm Brandon Hubner, and today installment 33 is coming your way. We'll call this episode A Heraldless War and a Man Named Themistocles. And as we get into the material for today, we can view it pretty much like a continuation of last episode, where we looked at the Ionian Revolt and the non-event of a naval battle at Lade. Persia effectively regained control of Ionia, as we saw, while Athens withdrew from the ill-fortuned revolt and turned her attention back to issues in and around Attica and the Peloponnese. The revolt in Ionia took place, more or less, over the span of years from 499 to 494 BCE, when the Ionians were in fact defeated at Lade. Then, in 493, Miletus was recaptured by the Persian satrap, and Persia also gained control of the area around the Hellespont to begin their creep further west and south toward Greece. Another event happened in 493, though. It's an event that, if we had been able to tune in to the local Athenian news of that day, probably would only have gotten airtime during the local politics segment of the news. Looking back from our vantage point, we can of course see that this event was much more significant, but I think that at the time, for Athenians, it may have seemed just like politics do to many of us today. Another politician took his place as eponymous archon of the city, for his term of one year, as had been the custom since the 7th century BCE. The man who took the archonship in 493 was named Themistocles, and it's his early life and time as archon that we will begin with here today. The fact that Themistocles even attained the office of archon is remarkable in and of itself. His father was technically part of the aristocracy, but political connections were as important then as they are now, and Themistocles' father never much participated in politics. A lot of what we know about the early life of Themistocles is recorded by Plutarch, with similar echoes and stories also contained in a handful of other writings. Although the anecdotes from Plutarch do reek of the mythologizing that's a bit typical of great men of history, so-called, even if we read the stories with a discerning eye, it still seems likely that Themistocles was born with a temperament and ambition well-suited to political and public life. Plutarch tells stories uh, like one about how Themistocles would practice giving speeches while his friends were outside playing, which is taken as a sign that he was destined for greatness from the beginning. There's also a rather well-known anecdote early in Plutarch's treatment where he recounts a story that he has heard elsewhere. He writes, quote, There are some who say that his father fondly tried to divert him from public life, pointing out to him old triremes on the seashore, all wrecked and neglected, and intimating that the people treated their leaders in like fashion when these were past service. Now, aside from any foreshadowing that this anecdote may have been intended to cast, we do know that Themistocles did not heed his father's advice. Plutarch also recounts stories about how Themistocles opted to live near the hangman's gate of Athens, despite the fact that he probably could have lived anywhere on his family's estates. The motivation for adopting these humbler abodes was to be very close to the Agora at all times, which was the center of political life and thought in Athens. Themistocles also became a lawyer, according to Plutarch, working as, quote, an impartial arbitrator to help Athenians settle out of court. His skills as an arbitrator and orator, not to mention his networking abilities as we would call them today, these led him to become well-known within the lower ranks of Athenian society. 
Themistocles was the working man's man, to continue with the translation into modern political terms. While all ambitious men of the past had come from the landed aristocracy and molded their policies to gain the support of the aristocracy, Themistocles came about at the perfect time to take advantage of the democratic reforms that had been instituted in Athens. He realized that a base of support was there for the tapping, and he seized the opportunity with both hands. Now, in writing his history of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides gives some backstory which includes a few discussions about Themistocles. It's interesting to consider the comments from Thucydides because he was writing most contemporaneously to the life of Themistocles. He was born less than a year before the Athenian general's death, so he would have been able to interview Athenians who knew Themistocles and perhaps even fought against the Persians. That being said, Thucydides does still seem to portray Themistocles as a bit of a superhuman when he writes that, quote, he could also excellently divine the good and evil which lay hidden in the unseen future. Given the events that will unfold over the coming few episodes, maybe we will indeed find this claim to be accurate. But to start out with, let's take one issue alone where the prescience of Themistocles may have been hugely influential in greater Athenian history. It's told that some of the earliest advice of Themistocles of this big picture nature was that, quote, Athens should stick to the sea and forthwith begin to lay the foundations of empire. It's fine and well that he personally could see the future import of sea power to the future of Athens as a city, but once he began to gain popularity within the city, any grand visions in his head had to be distilled into a concrete plan of action, which he could convey to the people and then push for it to become a reality. This brings us back around to where we started today, with Themistocles being elected to the role of eponymous archon for Athens in the year 493. In that role, he would have performed duties that are normally boiled down and described as the duties of a magistrate. His training and connections made as a lawyer would have served him well, and furthered his political ambitions most surely. But in essence, he would have helped organize the finances and details of state-sponsored religious festivals and things like that. Perhaps the more important of his functions as Archon was to give final judgments in legal cases of some kind, particularly involving inheritance and family issues, but he also served as an arbitrator in legal cases of other kinds as well. Thus, as eponymous archon, Themistocles was well positioned to have a direct influence on legal and political issues of some types, while at the same time exerting pressure and influence on similar issues that he took a personal interest in. The issue that he most championed during his one year as eponymous archon was an issue related to the naval facilities of Athens. The long-term vision of Themistocles came into play here because he could tell that without a more effective port, a more protected and defensible harbor, that Athens would never even have a hope of becoming the naval power that he felt she needed to be, to have even a glimmer of hope of standing up to Persian aggression. So then, let's talk about the port and harbor situation at Athens both before and then after the appearance of Themistocles upon the Greek stage. To talk about the port specifically, perhaps it would do to also talk about the geographical situation in Athens as a whole, so, you know, let's get geographical for a bit. I feel like that might become a regular segment for us here on the podcast, the let's get geographical corner or something. Time will tell, I guess, but geography does play a huge role in talks about naval and maritime history. 
part of this geography talk here today, we'll slide into a look at an island city-state that was a bit of a thorn in the side of Athens. But we'll tie that all together after some elaboration here. As for the city herself, the enduring symbols of Athens are her classical buildings. Although most of the ones that survive today post-date the war with Persia, the Acropolis is itself a direct result of the Greek victory in the war and the subsequent period of flowering in Greece. Even though this particular building came later, the site of the Acropolis, the hill on which it stands, was a center of settlement in Athens dating back to Mycenaean times and before. The sea is visible from the hills of Athens, and with the mountains that border Athens to the north and east, with water to the south and southwest, not to mention the Cephasus River that fed a relatively fertile plain, the location of Athens in the most ancient times was about as good as things got in Greece. While Athens never was a sea power prior to the Greco-Persian Wars, especially in comparison to many Greek city-states like Corinth, Miletus, and others, Athens did at least have easy access to a port in the Bay of Phaleron, which lay about five or six kilometers, roughly three and a half miles or so, southwest of Athens proper. This place was the bay that ancient Athenians used simply because it was the closest access to the sea in relation to the city. But as Pausanias also relates, it eventually took on the aura of myth. He writes that it was from Phaleron that, quote, Menestheus set sail with his fleet for Troy, and before him Theseus, when he went to give satisfaction to Minos, for the death of Androgeus. Mythical significance or no, it eventually became clear to anyone willing to see it that Phaleron was not a good port, at least not for any self-respecting city-state that wanted to grow and expand its reach if possible. There were two major incidents that demonstrated the weakness of Athens' use of Phaleron as her only port, and although these occurred a few years before the outbreak of the Ionian Revolt, these incidents also give us further knowledge as to the relative weakness of Athenian naval capabilities in this same period. The first incident occurred in 510 BCE, when Sparta sent an army to Athens to try and oust the Pesistratids, which were a family of tyrants that ruled Athens for several decades before 510. I believe that we mentioned last time that Sparta and her king Cleomenes got involved in Athenian politics by using military arms to oust these tyrants, among other involvement, and without getting wrapped up in the nitty-gritty, this incident was one of those. It relates to the weakness of Phaleron in this way. Herodotus writes that Sparta sent an army, quote, by sea on boats and they came ashore at Phaleron. They were driven back by Athenian arms and the allied cavalry forces from Thessaly, but it is rather remarkable that Sparta was so easily able to land an army directly on Athenian shores, so close to Athens herself, and that there's no mention of an attempt to stop them at sea, or of opposing Athenian ships even present at all. When your main port is so vulnerable to invasion like that, I would say that that's indicative of a major vulnerability. The second event is one that we'll flesh out a bit more here, since some of the players involved play a more direct role in the lead up to the Persian War and the buildup of the famed Athenian navy. This event may also have had a more direct impact on the vision of Themistocles as it formed during his youth into his adulthood, since he would have been alive during the majority of this event as it unfolded. 
Now, to call this one single event is probably a bit generous, since the details are rather lacking, and they allow us to form only a hazy picture of what all went on. Perhaps we'll just add in a multiplier here and call them events, so that we're clear on what we're talking about. And these are the events that made up the so-called Heraldless War between Athens and the island city-state of Aegina, or Aegina, however you like to pronounce it, I've heard it both ways. In the years leading up to 510 and then 506, Athens pursued a pretty steady policy of land expansion and conflict with her neighbors to the north and the west. Herodotus describes several different conflicts between Athens, Boeotia, where the principal city was Thebes, along with forces from Chalcis, where Athens was actually the aggressor. Now, in any event, as Athens continued in enmity with Thebes, the Boeotian city decided to recruit an ally in their struggle, and here is where the new player enters for us, the island polis of Aegina. Historically speaking, looking back from this point in 506 BCE, Aegina had grown into a sea power in the region, while Athens had not yet done so. Aegina was the only non-Ionian Greek city that participated in the trade at the Egyptian Emporium of Naucratis, which is a place that we've talked about a few times now. She was active there because her early history gave her a stable base from which to become a mercantile sea power. This is because while other city-states underwent periods of tyranny and unstable government, Aegina maintained a relatively stable oligarchy that emphasized trade and commerce. She's often cited as the earliest city-state to issue coins in or near mainland Greece, although locations in Ionia probably hold the distinction of being the first Greeks to do so overall. The coins are notable for their image of a sea turtle on one side and for the inclusion of a dolphin on the obverse at a later point in the city's history. This mercantile power of an island also developed a standard of weights and measures that was one of only two such standards commonly used in the entirety of the Greek world at this time, so her maritime and commercial strength is well attested. The enmity between Athens and Aegina dated back to the time of Solon, at least, which was the 590s BCE when he passed laws to hamper Aegean trade in Attica. From that point down to the events that we will now get into a bit more deeply, there's a lot of debate about the particulars of Aegina's history and enmity with Athens. Beyond her relationship with Athens, we do see some evidence that Aegina had also taken up a form of piracy as a supplemental income stream, you might say. Herodotus tells us that back in 524, Aegina sent ships to Crete to attack a contingent of Samians who had settled a colony there, ostensibly in retaliation for an attack that Samos had carried out against Aegina. Whatever the motivation, Herodotus includes that Aegina conquered them in a naval battle, enslaved them, cut off the boarhead images from the prows of the Samian ships, and dedicated them to the sanctuary of Athens in Aegina. This was a common symbolic prize taken after naval victories in ancient Greece, cutting off the figureheads of the ships. And really, in the Mediterranean as a whole, this was a common practice, the taking and dedication of the prow decoration. Now, let's get into the events of 506 BCE, though, to show us yet further why the Athenian use of Phaleron left them with a weak port. Aegina was recruited by Thebes to wage war against Athens, and Herodotus says that, quote, 
the Egenetans, both elated by their present prosperity and mindful of their ancient enmity toward the Athenians, now responded to the Theban request by waging an undeclared war against the Athenians. The debate about this enmity between Athens and Aegina centers on how long the undeclared or heraldless war lasted, as historians refer to it today, but also about when precisely this heraldless war began and other issues along those lines. This is because it does have some bearing on a few issues related to the start of the Greco-Persian War, and when precisely Athens built up her navy. That's why this timeline is subject to debate. Nevertheless, we'll aim to keep it simple here for now. The bottom line of the Heraldless War is contained in the next tidbit recited by Herodotus. He writes, quote, while the Athenians were occupied with their attack on Boeotia, the Aegeanetans sailed in warships to Attica and laid waste to Phaleron, as well as to many deems along the rest of the coast, and thus inflicted great damage on the Athenians. So, as we've established by now, for Athens to become a first-rate sea power, something more than the vulnerable Phaleron was needed. We got pulled into this point by way of geography, and although I haven't made it too clear yet, the geography comes in when we see that Aegina lay to the south of Athens, as it is an island in the Saronic Gulf, about 27 kilometers, or 17 miles south of Athens. Being that Aegina had superior naval strength all the way up until the dawn of the Greco-Persian Wars, Aegina was a real buffer on any mercantile or naval aspirations that Athens may have had. So this issue may have, and really to be more firm here, the issue almost certainly did have a large role in the lasting enmity between these two city-states. There was also a small island between Aegina and Athens that went by the name of Salamis, and although it's not of immediate concern to us yet, it's worth noting before we move on that Salamis was initially colonized by Aegina, and later taken over by Megara. So although Athens under Solon did eventually gain control of the island that lay really just off its coast, the possession of this island may also have played a role in the ongoing feuds and fighting between Athens and the two neighboring island city-states just mentioned. Alright, though maybe not well organized, the last few minutes should suffice as far as the role of Aegina and the simple geography of Salamis and the island are concerned. The other major item of interest again concerns the questions of why Athens didn't have a substantial trireme fleet at this point in its history. To quote an enlightening article on this question, quote, Why was the Athenian fleet still made up of pentaconters when both the Persians and the Ionian states were using the superior trireme? Well, the concise answer seems to be that while Corinth and several Ionian city-states had the wherewithal and need to build triremes, the strategic aims of Athens did not require expensive ships with the tactical advantages, but also the tactical limitations of triremes. This holds true in the Athenian conflict with Aegina during the 6th century BCE as well where the conflict took on the nature of back-and-forth piratical raids more than it did an actual war of any kind. Particulars of this conflict are elaborated by Herodotus in Book 5 of his histories, and he does mention the use of a single trireme by Athens, but this lone appearance isn't quite enough to invalidate our general theory here, that Athens didn't really use the trireme at this point in their history. 
The article that these points are coming from is titled Athenian Naval Power Before Themistocles. I'll link to it on the website as has become customary. And to again quote from it and present us with a segue today, we can note that in the conflict between Athens and Aegina, that, quote, it's not surprising that both sides used the archetypal pirate ship, the Pentaconter. The nature of this long-standing war goes a long way in explaining the pre-Themistoclean navy. For Pentaconters, which were affordable enough to be owned by private individuals such as merchants and aristocrats, were the optimum vessel for privateering, an activity useful to the state and profitable to the individual. The way that this scenario is described is a bit evocative of how we saw much older conflicts, particularly the Trojan War, and the coastal raiding that played a large role in the events that probably formed a basis for those legends and myths as they grew up and were eventually solidified by Homer. As we prepare to leave our look at this conflict between Athens and Aegina, the ships involved and the like, although we will mention them a bit further on today, so we're not leaving totally yet. At this point, though, I think a few specific lines from Thucydides can help us bridge the gap over to our next item of consideration. Early in Book 1 of his History of the Peloponnesian War, he writes a few paragraph-long summaries of the naval development in early Greece. Uh, Corinth figures heavily, as does Ionia, both of which we've said had triremes earliest of all the Greeks. Samos and her tyrant Polycrates are mentioned, as are the Phocaeans and their brief stint in the Tyrrhenian Sea, and the resultant conflict with Carthage there. To continue now, here's a reading of the most relevant paragraph for us today, and the these that leads it off are the city-states that we just reviewed. Thucydides writes, quote, These were the most powerful navies, and even these, although so many generations had elapsed since the Trojan War, seem to have been principally composed of the old fifty oars and longboats, and to have counted few triremes among their ranks. Indeed, it was only shortly before the Persian War and the death of Darius, the successor of Cambyses, that the Sicilian tyrants and the Corsirians acquired any large number of triremes. For after these there were no navies of any account in Hellas till the expedition of Xerxes. Aegina, Athens, and others may have possessed a few vessels, but they were principally fifty oars. It was quite at the end of this period that the war with Aegina and the prospect of the barbarian invasion enabled Themistocles to persuade the Athenians to build the fleet with which they fought at Salamis and even these vessels had not complete decks. And so we come back once again to Themistocles, having followed the thread that wound through the heraldless war and brought us to Athens during the archonship of Themistocles in 493 BCE. The short version of what we've just spent probably 10 or 15 minutes elaborating is that Phaleron was a sad excuse for a port, and although Themistocles knew it, his task was to convince his fellow Athenians that something needed to be done. The enmity between Athens and Aegina will be used as a political chip in due time, so don't forget about their enmity just yet, but as we continue on today, let's go ahead and take a look at what Themistocles thought was the best solution to the weaknesses of Phaleron, and why his proposal was a step forward. The solution pushed by Themistocles during his archonship was to move the focus of Athenian shipping from Phaleron to an area known as Piraeus. We've of course expounded on the weaknesses inherent in the use of only Phaleron as the Athenian port. 
So then we must ask ourselves why Piraeus would be any better. This was, of course, a center of the debate during the archonship of Themistocles, and one point made by his opponents was that Piraeus was two miles further away from Athens than Phaleron had been. Despite its greater distance from the city, Themistocles won the argument by virtue of the reality that Piraeus was a vastly superior harbor. I'll post a detailed map of the Piraeus on the website if any of you are curious, although I'm sure a simple Google search will also pull up a map of the area. In essence, this site was in the most ancient of times an island off the coast of Athens. Over time, the silt buildup turned it into a promontory that was connected to Greece, and by the time of Themistocles, it was a promontory that presented three natural harbors ripe for use. These three harbors and the geography of the area are what drew the gaze of Themistocles, and in time, he convinced enough of his countrymen that this location would be more easily defensible and much more useful for an Athenian navy, that the city elected to transfer its base of naval operations from Phaleron the extra two miles up and over to the Piraeus. Because it was that distance further away from the city proper, they also decided to build a wall connecting the city to the harbor. In 493, during his year of archonship, Themistocles managed to rile up a base of support strong enough that the construction was started, a project that cannot have been cheap by any means. I like the characterization that you sometimes see painted onto Themistocles, that of a Churchillian character who could see the growing specter of a threat to his country and the route that his countrymen ought to take to prepare while they still had the chance. He got the ball rolling, at least, in 493, as Thucydides tells us that the walls connecting the city to the Piraeus were only begun during the year of Themistocles' archonship, but they were apparently not finished until much later. Themistocles must have managed enough to get the project started, but when a Persian navy didn't appear on the horizon that summer following Laude, the people seem to have quickly lost sight of the importance that lay in constructing a defensive bulwark just in case Persia did show up in any of the subsequent sailing seasons. That's not to say that Athens and her neighboring Greek cities didn't prepare for what was increasingly the sure bet that Persia would show up eventually, but they didn't put their work of preparation into bolstering a navy or a naval base. Their efforts were channeled more toward other preparations and military matters on land. Themistocles had managed to get the project started, but as I said, all signs point to the fact that only a small beginning of the wall out to the Piraeus had been started in 493. Thucydides says that despite the fact that the entirety of his plan hadn't come to fruition during his archonship, that Themistocles still stuck to his guns. He continued to champion his long-term vision. Thucydides writes, quote, The fleet claimed most of his attention. He saw that the approach by sea was easier for the Persian king's army than that by land. He also thought the Piraeus more valuable than the upper city. Indeed, he was always advising the Athenians, if a day should come when they were hard-pressed by land, to go down into the Piraeus and defy the world with their fleet. Despite the repeated exhortations of Themistocles, Athens put a pause on the Piraeus project in 493. This same year saw the destruction of Miletus and the Persian retribution against the Ionian cities that dared to stand against Persia during the failed Ionian rebellion. As we wrapped up by saying last episode, 
Persia continued to conquer Thrace and to take control of the regions around the Hellespont and into Macedonia, surely with the aim of cutting off any Greek access to the Black Sea trade of grain and other foodstuffs that the growing Greek cities had come to rely on more heavily. Even though Persia's shadow continued to grow and it began to cast a wider swath of dark across the Greek mainland, the major Greek city-states had begun to realize their situation and to largely put aside the factionalism that had been part and parcel of their history. They'd finally begun to realize that there was some measure of strength to be found in a more unified approach to the Persian threat. And although it wouldn't appear as any astounding measure of unified action or cooperation today with our modern political federations and governmental bodies, for ancient Greece, the cooperation that started to emerge was actually rather remarkable. The most remarkable cooperation was, of course, that between Sparta and Athens, but a discussion of this topic requires us to confront one of the harsh realities of political posturing in a situation like this, and it's a reality that's played itself out over and over throughout history. Take Sparta first here. With her rather aggressive king Cleomenes, Sparta took advantage of the Persian specter to effectively conquer one of her rival neighbor city-states on the Peloponnese the city of Argos. Argos lay about midway between Sparta and Corinth, and with a good harbor only seven miles from the city, Argos was well poised to be a healthy city in Greece compared to many others. The problem from the Spartan perspective was that Argos was a historical rival, and Argos would stop at nothing to see Sparta ruined, even if that meant medizing allying herself with Persia and giving the Persian army and navy a base right there in the center of the Peloponnese. This would, of course, end Greece's hopes for victory before they'd really even begun, so Cleomenes took decisive action in 494, and he wiped Argos from the Greek map. Some histories take it at face value that Argos had taken steps to ally with Persia, while other histories leave open the possibility that Sparta may have simply used the specter of Persian invasion as a handy justification for annihilating her regional rival. I really haven't delved into the reality here too deeply to try to discern which possibility seems more likely, but it wouldn't surprise me to find out that Cleomenes and Sparta exaggerated the Argive sympathy for Persia just a bit in order to justify their takeover. Regardless, the Spartan takeover of Argos closed the door on any potential for Persia to gain a foothold there. It was a statement of Spartan intent to stand against the eastern threat. Athens, too, took several steps that broadcast a similar intent. The first was to welcome back a rather infamous political figure who divided the public opinion in Athens. His name was Miltiades the Younger. His father had been the tyrant of a colony in Thrace, while Miltiades himself had been the eponymous archon in Athens back in 524. His reputation was, well, not good. He'd basically been the puppet of the tyrant Hippias, and when his father died, Miltiades was sent to take over the tyranny his father had previously run in Thrace. It wasn't long, of course, before Darius and Persia moved in and took over Thrace, so Miltiades quickly submitted and became a Persian vassal. After some vassal-like activity for a period of years, he fled, he joined up with the Ionian Revolt, but was again on the losing side there. All in all, he wound up fleeing the Persians again and hoping that his native city would welcome him back in 493 BCE. Thus, Herodotus tells us that Miltiades, quote, filled five triremes with all his wealth and sailed away to Athens, 
en route he encountered the Phoenician fleet, and although Miltiades himself and four of his ships managed to escape to Imbros, his fifth ship was pursued and taken by the Phoenicians. The long and short of it was that four triremes sailed into a Piraeus that may have been in the early stages of its construction, or maybe they made land at Phaleron since it was closer and it was the historic Athenian port. Either way, as he made land, Miltiades was arrested, and there are many details about how his political enemies in Athens hoped to make him pay for the tyranny that he ran in Thrace. He'd earned himself a bad reputation there. However, his trial in 492 BCE resulted in acquittal, and the one-time vassal of Persia's king was then elected to serve as one of his tribe's generals, a clear sign that Athens also intended to stand up to the Persian threat. The second action taken by Athens in its stand against Persia is arguably as controversial as the actions taken by Sparta to conquer Argos. Earlier today, we laid out some of the history between the athens aegina rivalry, the Heraldless War, it's often called. The end of this enmity occurred in 491 BCE, but it seems to have been instigated by an increase in Persian activity in and around Greece. So let's take it from 492 and then work our way back down to the second concrete stand taken by Athens. Miltiades fled back to Athens because of the Persian moves to retake Thrace, the Hellespont, and then move into Macedonia in 492. Herodotus says that this Persian offensive led by Mardonius, the son-in-law of King Darius, his campaign was intended to reach Eretria and ultimately Athens herself to fulfill the promise of the king to destroy Athens. Really, here, I think, let's pull a paragraph from Herodotus that gives us all the detail that we could wish regarding a naval disaster that befell the Phoenician Persian fleet during this opening campaign of what we'll call Persia's first invasion of Greece. Herodotus writes, quote, Eretria and Athens were the professed goals of the expedition, but what the Persians really intended was to subjugate as many Greek cities as they could. And with their fleet, they subjugated the island of Thassos, whose inhabitants did not even lift a finger to oppose them, while with their army they added the Macedonians to their already existing host of slaves, for all the peoples east of Macedon had already become Persian subjects. From Thassos, the fleet crossed over and sailed close to the shore of the mainland up to Acanthos, from which they set out in an attempt to round Mount Athos. But as they were sailing around it, a strong north wind came up on them, which was so impossible to deal with that it battered them badly and wrecked many of their ships against the shore of Mount Athos. In fact, it is said that about 300 of their ships were destroyed, with more than 20,000 men. And since the sea is full of savage creatures, some were snatched up and killed by them, while others were dashed upon the sharp rocks. Some men perished because they did not know how to swim, and still others died from the cold. So that is what happened to the fleet there. I really just love how Herodotus can get so descriptive and vivid for most of the passage, and then he'll just throw in a very matter-of-fact closer, like that one above, so that's what happened to the fleet there. Anyway, the blow to the Persian fleet was very severe, as you can tell just from the simple figures. The weather would, of course, continue to be an obstacle for Persia to overcome, as it has been throughout history for any invading forces moving into unfamiliar territory, whether on land or sea, at least if they failed to do proper planning and recon work. 
The reasons why many of the Persian sailors died as well, as Herodotus outlines them, these are common reasons why many sailors and oarsmen would die during naval conflicts, even if they weren't killed by ship collisions or direct ramming attacks or things like that. The elements are much more deadly, and many of the Persian oarsmen and soldiers aboard the ships did not know how to swim. As for the sea monsters that Herodotus alludes to eating some of the sailors, well, who knows. Now, as we begin to roll toward a conclusion here today, let's take a look at what Persia did in the aftermath of this naval disaster, since the way that various Greek city-states reacted had a few different results. One, some places just pissed off the Persians more than they had already been up to this point, which isn't saying nothing. But second, the reaction of some cities was used as a justification by other cities to turn against their fellow Greeks, so let's take a look at those two results here now to close. Herodotus says that in the year following the naval disaster that struck the Persian fleet, that, quote, Darius tried to test the Hellenes to find out whether they intended to wage war against him or surrender to him. He sent out heralds in all directions throughout Hellas and ordered them to ask for earth and water for the king. Momentarily, uh, we'll note why the earth and water were significant, but Herodotus also says that while these heralds were traveling Greece, that, quote, he sent others to his tribute-paying cities along the coast with orders to build warships and vessels to transport horses. So, while the coastal cities and various islands both around Greece and in Asia Minor and Phoenicia were apparently busy re-strengthening the Persian-controlled navy following their losses, heralds were traveling Greece proper as well. Come to think of it, I vaguely recall talking about the earth and water offerings at some point in the past, but in essence this was a demand that Persia made when they were offering an enemy the chance to surrender voluntarily, in a way. It symbolized the submission of the land and the water to the Persian king. Many authors remark on the connection that this has to Zoroastrianism, the religion of the Persians at this time, and though I'm no expert at all on this connection, it's worth seeking out more if you're interested in the religious symbolism here. So then, as we said, different Greek cities reacted differently to the appearance of Persian heralds in their city, who demanded this sacrifice of earth and water. This whole topic here involves uh, some of the recently famous scenes from the movie 300, if you've seen that and if you care much for Hollywood adaptions of ancient history like this. I can take it or leave it depending on my mood, but that's not really relevant here to our talk today, I guess. So when the heralds appeared in Athens and demanded a sacrifice of earth and water, Herodotus says that the Athenians cast the heralds into a pit. But when the heralds arrived in Sparta, the Spartans had them thrown into something even deeper, a well, and told them to find their earth and water down in the well. It's often said that the Athenians merely embarrassed the heralds by refusing in this manner, while the Spartans killed them by letting them drown in the bottom of that well. Herodotus doesn't say this explicitly, but it's clear that Athens and Sparta were the two city-states that chose to refuse the Persian option of surrender in the most bold terms possible. Yet another clear sign that they had determined to stand up to the Persian menace, no matter the cost. Many other cities, and especially the island city-states, Herodotus says, did not resist the Persian request for earth and water, and the city-state that's mentioned most explicitly as having quickly acquiesced to the Persian advance was the island city-state of Aegina. Surprise, surprise, right? 
You knew they'd make a final appearance for us today, I hope, and boy, what a conclusion to the story of the heraldless war we have here today. Herodotus writes that as soon as Aegina gave earth and water to the Persian heralds, quote, the Athenians assailed them, thinking that the Aeginetans had granted the king's request out of hostility to themselves, in order to mark with the Persians. Happily exploiting this pretext, they went to Sparta, where they accused the Aeginetans of betraying Hellas. Sparta under Cleomenes was also quite happy to listen to Athens and also use this event as pretext for sending an armed contingent to Aegina to arrest the leading islanders who'd assented to the Persian demand for earth and water. The first Spartan force was rebuffed, and some internal political disagreement between the two kings of Sparta led to a bit of a power struggle at home for them. But within a year, Cleomenes had managed to have a different king join him at the pinnacle of Sparta's power structure. On his second armed venture to Aegina, the Spartan king arrested ten of the wealthiest Aeginetans and delivered them captive to Athens, in revenge for the aforementioned incident. Now, the pretext that Athens and Sparta used to move in arms against Aegina may have been a pretext, but it did also involve Persian presence in Greece. The Persian demand for earth and water was a bold indication of Persian intent to lay claim to Greek territory, and then, we can be sure based on the failed invasion of Mardonius, to later return and take physical control of Greece. Looked at in this light, it's a bit more understandable that Athens and Sparta were wary of Aegina's potential of becoming a perfect naval base and staging ground for a future Persian invasion, given the island's perfect location in the Saronic Gulf, as we outlined earlier. This location was, after all, a large reason why the island had become a maritime merchant power in earlier years. So, although the Athenian move against the island was assuredly cynical and opportunistic in part, it was also strategic in the grander scheme as far as Persia was involved. The Spartan arrest of these ten Aeginetan aristocrats wasn't the end of their enmity yet, though. When the Spartan king Cleomenes died the next year, Aegina made their move to denounce his intimidation and arrest of their people. They sent an envoy to Sparta and Athens to demand the release of the prisoners. Athens, as you might expect, refused to release the prisoners of their rival city-state, and so Aegina began to plot revenge. Conveniently for them, Athens was in the middle of a festival celebration. Herodotus says that the celebration was taking place off the coast of Cape Sunion, a promontory that is the southernmost point in Attica. In the 440s BCE, a temple to Poseidon was built on this cape, and it's likely that the Athenian festival that was taking place back in 490 BCE was in honor of Poseidon. In any event, we read that, quote, the Aeginetans set up an ambush and seized the ship carrying the sacred officials with many of the leading men of Athens on board. After capturing these men, they bound them in chains. Although this sounds like a cunning and well-executed plan of revenge against Athens, it really just served to prod Athens into upping the stakes in this still ongoing heraldless war of which this festival ship heist was just a small part. As we outlined earlier, Aegina had a decent-sized fleet of ships thanks to her maritime heritage, while Athens hadn't quite yet come into her own. So in planning how best to take their revenge against the Aeginetan revenge, Athens sought the aid of a city with whom Herodotus says Athens was, quote, the best of friends. 
Corinth gave Athens 20 ships to help prepare for an offensive against Aegina, bringing the total number of ships at Athenian disposal to 70. Some sources say that Corinth gave these ships to Athens outright, charging only a token fee for each ship, while other sources say that Corinth only let Athens borrow the ships. But given that they would potentially be destroyed or captured in battle, it's likely that Corinth just adopted the old practical advice of letting a friend borrow something without expecting to receive it back, and merely being pleased and surprised if it does ever actually return to you. Beyond the fact that Athens borrowed 20 triremes from Corinth and then sent her 70-ship fleet to sail against Aegina, Herodotus doesn't tell us a whole lot more, other than that the Aegeanetans fought a sea battle against them but were defeated. Athens had recruited an Aegeanetan exile to try and foment a revolt on the island as well, and this attempt did actually lead to some class warfare and resultant executions on the island in this same time frame, so Aegina did have a lot to deal with all at once. The balance of what Herodotus tells us in this portion of his narrative is that Athens slaughtered 1,000 Argives who went to Aegina to help the island resist Athens, another dark mark in the annals of struggle amongst the various Greek cities. Herodotus then concludes his remarks related to the heraldless war by telling us of a small consolation prize that Aegina managed to grab this occurring in 490 BCE from everything we can deduce, at least. He writes, quote, Sometime later, when the Aegeanetans spotted the Athenian ships foundering in disorder, they attacked and this time won the battle, taking four Athenian ships with their crews. Small consolation for Aegina here. Now, a bit of the date confusion that I alluded to earlier comes from the fact that this point is the last point where Herodotus mentions Aegina in Book 6 of the Histories. The next mention comes in his discussion of 480 BCE, when Xerxes is leading the more famous Persian invasion of Greece. Herodotus there alludes to various Greek city-states that joined the resistance against Persia, even though they hadn't historically stood against the invader. And in that context, he says that the Hellenes decided that they needed to end their existing hostilities and wars. He says that, quote, the most serious of them was that between the Athenians and the Aegeanetans but it's still unclear really what else had occurred between 490 and 480 BCE in the Heraldless War, if indeed it even continued on to that point. The concrete sources are what we've already outlined from Herodotus today, involving the various naval clashes between these two cities in what we can best surmise is 491 and 490 BCE. We'll end here today with another obvious sentence from good old Herodotus, and then a transition point to set the stage for next time. The obvious part is his sentence, quote, So the Athenians waged war against the Aegeanetans. That's a one-sentence summary of most of what we've talked about in this episode here today, but what we'll move on to cover next time is summed up in the balance of that paragraph from Herodotus. He says, quote, Meanwhile, the Persian was attending to his own concerns, as he was constantly being reminded by a servant to remember the Athenians. Darius himself wanted to seize this pretext to subjugate all those Hellenes who had refused to give him earth and water. Since Mardonius had failed on his expedition, Darius relieved him of his command and appointed other generals. Datis a Mede, by race and Artifernes, son of his brother Artifernes. Darius sent these generals off, instructing them to enslave Athens and Eretria, 
and to bring back the captive slaves to his presence. Thus, despite the naval disaster that befell Mardonius, while Athens and Aegina nagged each other during their heraldless war into 490 BCE, Darius was readying ships and men for another attempt at invasion of Greece. And it's there that we'll pick back up next time around on the Maritime History Podcast. I appreciate all of your patience as I readied this episode for launch, and I ended up battling some illness again in between episodes. But for the time being, I think I'm good to go, and we'll aim to move things along as the new year is rung in. I want to thank you all for the spate of new reviews to close out the year 2017. I know we mentioned a little while ago that we were nearing the 100 reviews mark, and we've quickly blown past that number, which is humbling and uh, just, just really great to me. So thank you to iTunes users, Slarty Bartfast2, Jalen M, A Chabot1951, Taxi, and even a review from Gandalf himself. As for the penultimate review there from Texi, I hope that the longer episodes of late don't scare you away, but as the podcast moves forward, I do need to try to rein in the length a bit to get episodes out more often, so I think that will be one of my main goals here in the coming future. Although with topics like Artemisium and Salamis on the near horizon, I guess we'll see how that goal pans out. For our members, I'll have a new episode ready in the month of January here in the coming weeks, so do look for that. I'm also toying around with the idea of um, reading through the Aubrey Maturin novels as part of our member portion of the podcast, or having some type of um, in-depth read-along, even though I'm sure I can't read the actual novels due to copyright But anyways, let me know what you guys think about that. I've recently read the first few novels in that series, and I've really enjoyed them. Anyways, I will have a new member episode ready in the month of January, too. I've gotten a fair number of episode transcripts posted on the website, and uh, I've gotten the timeline updated accordingly also, so look for those items if they're of interest to you. Thank you one and all for the support in 2017 and for the continued encouragement that I've received from many of you. It means quite a lot to know that so many people have found the podcast to be of use. Last but not least, I wanted to thank my family for the amazing Christmas gifts that I got this year, many of which were podcast related. My sister added to my stack of reading with a good book about sea power and naval strategy, so that'll be perfect material to add to our source list here ongoing. Thanks to my parents also for a much improved sound shield to use in recording these episodes. I think it should help improve the sound quality quite a bit. I've already put it to use on this episode. So please do let me know if you think it's helped or hindered the sound at all. I'm still trying to get it dialed in perfectly, I hope. And then uh, finally, also my brother hooked me up with an Amazon gift card that I'm sure will just go toward even more books, maybe on Roman naval matters for our upcoming season once we're out of Greece. So thanks to my family again, and maybe they even listen to the podcast, who knows? Really, I can't go past this point either without thanking my lovely wife, who consents to let me spend probably too much time in working on and producing the podcast as well. All right, then. That does it for me today. Signing off for the Maritime History Podcast and thanking you for listening once again, I'm Brandon Hubner. Until next time, fair winds and following seas from the Maritime History Podcast.